Eh, estamos muy complacidos de, de, de ver tantas personas diversas en el, en el público. Hay un equipo chévere, la Javeriana, bienvenidos. Eh, estudiantes, exalumnos, eh, miembros de otras escuelas. Para nosotros es un verdadero placer tener al profesor Fray eh, en la Tadeo, en una alianza que estamos haciendo con, con la Universidad de Ibagué, que como ustedes saben, pues es una universidad que está creciendo eh, eh, vertiginosamente, con teorías nuevas de diseño, eh, y nos sentimos muy sintonizados con el trabajo que, que está liderando Daniel Lopera eh, allá en la Universidad de Ibagué. Solamente para rememorar un poquito, esta es la segunda vez que tenemos la fortuna de tener a Tony Fray aquí en Colombia, la primera vez fue ya hace seis años, cuando hicimos la primera, la primera Bienal de, de Diseño y estábamos, eh, de pronto algunos de ustedes que, que veo que hay egresados lo recordarán, eh, en esa primera Bienal eh, estábamos eh, validando antes de, de, de presentarnos uh, para, el, para el primer circuito de, de acreditación, estábamos validando algunas posturas nuevas que teníamos o que queríamos fortalecer en torno a lo que estábamos haciendo con el diseño industrial eh, aquí en la Tadeo, recogiendo un poco la tradición, pero mirando eh, algunas fronteras que queríamos eh, tal vez eh, trasgredir disciplinarmente y, y de allí se fundaron otras dos eh, rutas, op opciones de grado, que, que hoy en día pues, ya, ya tienen eh, bastante trayectoria. Eh, en ese momento, como ustedes saben, el profesor Alfredo Gutiérrez pues, ha hecho varios trabajos en torno a ese diseño de frontera y eh, empezó a ponernos en conocimiento del profesor Fray. Eh, posteriormente, el profesor Fernando Álvarez lo integró a su eh, grupo de trabajo para su tesis doctoral y eh, en esa medida pues, se ha venido estableciendo una relación académica con, con, con Tony desde ya hace algún tiempo y en el contexto también de los, de los proyectos doctorales de los profesores Fernando Álvarez eh, y Alfredo Gutiérrez, eh, el doctorado que están terminando en la Universidad de Manizales, esperemos que algún día ese milagro ocurra. Y pues nada, eh, seguramente ustedes conocen mejor que yo eh, quién es el profesor Tony Fry, pero solamente para recordar, es eh, filósofo, ha estudiado muchísimo la perspectiva contemporánea del de diseño, eh, integrando la no sostenibilidad, las políticas eh, y la cultura. Eh, Tony Fry es eh, director de estudios <coughs> en el eh, Edge of the World in Tasmania, en el estudio the Edge, At the Edge of, of the World in Tasmania. Fue fundador y director del Ecodesign en Sydney y profesor visitante en la Universidad de Ibagué en Colombia, entre otras muchas otras cosas que ha hecho y ha tenido varias publicaciones. Ha ocupado varias eh, posiciones académicas y ha dirigido proyectos de investigación en Australia a nivel internacional. Tony ha sido galardonado en concursos de diseño y ha trabajado en Asia, Estados Unidos, América Latina y Europa. Es autor de 12 libros, eh, su última publicación es Remarking eh, Cities y es de Bloomsbury, Londres, en el 2017 fue la última publicación. Entonces, pues bueno, creo que todos estamos aquí para escuchar a Tony, entonces bienvenidos, Tony. Gracias. Buenos días, es uh, un placer estar aquí. Disculpe el presentario, el decía en inglés. Design after design is a way of saying design is more important than the way in which we understand design at the moment. We live in a very complicated world with many challenges. So design, from my point of view, is becoming more and more important. We are only going to get to a viable future by design. So I'm saying, to begin with, design is very important indeed. Now, one of the 
problems of the world that we have, uh, especially people who are exposed to the challenges of conflict, of climate change, of economic problems, and many of the other environmental problems, is that many people are frightened, many people despair, many people think we have an impossible situation. Many people think we cannot overcome, as human beings, the challenges that we face. So one of the most important things about the future of design is enabling people to see, in spite of the problems, that we can have a viable, possible future. So how do we bring the challenges to us? How do we understand that in order to be able to design in the circumstances that we are in, we have to understand the world as designed? The world as designed is everything that we are familiar with. The cities, the products, the ways in which we enjoy pleasure, uh, the way in which we are educated. Everything that we have within the world, within the world in which we exist, is designed. Design has changed the natural world. So we have a big contradiction. We have the contradiction between the expanse of design as the entitled environment in which we live, as it exists within the biological, natural environment, and we have design knowledge, design professions that only occupy and engage a very small part of that world. So to be able to deal with the problems that we are facing, we have to be able to expand design as a practice. We have to go beyond the limits of knowledge, the limits of the professions, the limits of the disciplines. Uh, Albert Einstein pointed out, you can't solve a problem with the thinking that created the problem. In terms of design, you can't engage the world's problems that are produced by design, by design as it currently exists. So we have to change design, and we can't do it quickly. We can't find immediate solutions. We have to find a process. We have to find places to begin. So what I want to try to show you this morning is how that is possible. How we can actually start to think about design in a new way. So, in a way, we have to unmake the way that we think. When we learn a practice, when we're taught how to be designers, we acquire uh, a taken-for-granted knowledge. It's in sociology, it's called a habitus. So there are the things that you are taught formally, and there are the things that you learn informally, the things that you simply learn by watching people, the things that you take for granted. This is where we have to start to make a change. We have to make present all the things that we take for granted. And we have to do that through a process of reflection. We have to make ourselves think about how we think. We need to make ourselves think about how we think. So, let me just put the world into a, a, com into a context. One of the ways in which it's now being described is as the Anthropocene, 
the moment where human impacts uh, are really changing the world. And, and the most dramatic example of that is arriving by people recognizing we are at the beginning of the sixth extinction event. The, the, the last extinction event was 283 million years ago. As a result of that, over 90% of all animal life disappeared. We are the result of that 10% that was left over. What's happened uh, is that we've begun a process by the way that we've made the world and as a result of the impact of the world that we've made that is taking the future away, that is creating the possibility of ourselves and all the life that we depend upon becoming extinct. That is how serious the problem is. The reason why people are not taking it seriously is because it's going to take a very long time. It's going to take a thousand or several thousand years for that disaster to happen. But the disasters have already started and they will increase, they will escalate. At the moment, there are around about seven or eight million refugees in the world. Some result from conflict, some are resulting from climate. By the middle of this century, between 2050 and 2070, there is likely to be 150 million refugees as a result of both climate and conflict. That's a figure that is conservative. That is a figure from the OECD. Other people think there will be more. Now, if you just think about how badly the world is coping with just a few million refugees, you can see how that is just one example of the challenges that we face. Climate change is something that everybody now who is at all informed recognizes it's a very serious problem. But that problem is going to get worse. That problem is going to continue for centuries. That problem is accumulating. The, the, the life of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is hundreds of years. At the moment, we are, in a way, uh, being exposed to emissions from the end of the last and the previous century. <coughs> so, so climate change uh, is not only a technical and scientific problem which will have a huge impact on life on this planet, but it is also something that is an enormous challenge to design and imagination. The effect of climate change is that we're going to have to find ways of adapting. We're going to have to find other ways of living. We're going to have to find other ways of providing shelter. We're going to have to find other ways of producing food. Uh, and that is a challenge of imagination. Uh, to give you just one example of how serious it is, already in central China, the agricultural system is failing. Part of the area in which people are working is becoming hot, very hot indeed. And as a result of that, more than five hours exposure to the sun will kill you. If you're out all day in the sun, you will die. So that's one place, that's the beginning of a problem that is going to spread across the world, across the equatorial belt. Tragically, the people that are at the greatest risk 
the people that are most exposed to the danger are the poorest people of the world. The peoples of Africa and Asia who don't have the economic and technical resources to create conditions that will protect them. They don't have the opportunity of air conditioning and all of those things. So that's part of the context. But these situations are changing us. We are a consequence in so many ways of climate, the way that we live, what we dress, what we eat. All of those things have affected how we are. So looking towards the future, what is actually going to happen is the privileged will be able to protect themselves, the underprivileged won't. At the same time, there are other impacts upon us, particularly from technology. So we think of ourselves as all being the same, as all being human beings. But that's changing. And the notion of being a human being isn't a natural classification. It was an imposition. It was an imposition of a category in modernity from the West. Now, in the colonial occupation of the world, as you are aware, the, the indigenous people had other cosmologies, had other understandings of what they were as a being. Modernity imposed the human. The modernity has meant that dominantly throughout the world, people are now classified as human beings. But that is fragmenting. That is starting to break up. What is happening at one end is technology is changing what we are. We were always technological beings from our very beginning in existence 200 million years ago, so 200,000 years ago, we picked up a stone and used it as a tool. That tool, that stone, started to change us and started to change the world. Uh, originally, before we arrived as a species, before we arrived as Homo sapiens, earlier forms of human life, 175,000 years ago, had a brain that was 30% smaller than ours. In the development of the use of tools, as life became more complicated, their brain developed. So when we arrived as a species 200,000 years ago, we inherited about 70 tools, stone tools, and all the tools of wood and bones that those tools made. So we arrived in a condition of complexity that we continue to make complex. And as we've made the world more complex, we have also become more complex. So technology has changed us. We were always technological beings, but now technology potentially can dominate us and over, can overwhelm us. So at one extreme, there is a possibility of people becoming far more technological. But at the other extreme, there are all those people in the world who are being abandoned. All those people who have no resources. Those people who are displaced. Those people who cannot survive in any adequate way. Those people who are being classified as lesser human beings. So human life is no longer a single value, but a multiple value. The highly valued human life and the life that has almost no value at all. 
the dehumanized human. People at the moment living in detention centers as refugees, they have their name taken away. They have their occupation taken away. They've lost their home. Some of them have lost their families. They've lost the place that they grew up in. They are treated in an entirely different way than you and me. So when I say the number of popul refugees in the world is dramatically increasing, also that means the number of people that are dehumanized is dramatically increasing. Now these are not distant problems of design. These situations impact upon design, as I'm going to try to show you. So we're, work, we're looking at really um, a relation to technology that has to change, a relation to human culture that has to change, and a relation to design that has to change. So, I'm inviting you to review your own situation, your own practice, your own relation to the way in which you view the function of design in this country. Now, the way in which you identify an ambition. Where do you want to go? What do you want to make? Are you going to refuse to engage the challenges or are you going to try to meet the challenges? So I'm pleased that you're here. I'm pleased that you're listening to me. But what I want to achieve is I want you to go away and think about the implication of what I'm saying to you. So let me show you some images that give you a, a slightly different picture. So what I've been saying is that we know a lot about design as it is. We know a lot about how to design. We don't know a lot about why to design. Human beings have been incredibly good at acquiring technical knowledge. They've been very bad at understanding the consequences of what they bring into existence. So we create all sorts of technologies, but we really don't know in time what their impact is going to be. You know, you can think of many examples yourself. So somebody, Alexandra Graham Bell, invite, invents the telephone. Obviously, Neither he nor anybody at the time had any idea of where that would lead. They had no idea that people would be able to look at each other on the telephone, that they would be able to access huge amounts of information via a device that started with the inception of the telephone, that the telephone would create a culture would be a political instrument, would be an instrument that changed people's lives. So this is the way I want you to understand design. We're born into a world of design. Slowly, we become users of design. Design arrives for us as soon as we arrive in the world. A nurse with rubber gloves on touches you. 
you're touched with the artificial before you're touched by the natural. You might be helped into the world with a pair of forceps. You're put in to a sterile environment. Your mother is in a particular kind of hospital or at home with a midwife. So we are born into a world biologically and a world unnaturally. So slowly we become as usual things. Those things are introduced as toys, the things to play with. And slowly those things start to design us. We have a pair of shoes. We learn how to put those shoes on. We learn how to use the things in the world. And that starts to change us. We start to become able to utilize things in the way that we choose to use them. So that is able to be described as the ontological consequences of design. The being of things change our being. So unknowingly, we start to design. Every human being designs. Every human being creates, prefigures in their mind an outcome in the world before it exists. Some of us choose to become designers as an identity and a profession. So, as we've done that over time, we start to create things in the world that design and transform the world. And because we've done it without an understanding of the consequences, we have enormous problems. So, when another child is born into the world, effectively they are not born into the same world. We are transforming the world all the time. And one of the problems that we have is that we're incredibly dynamic in terms of our activity and our impact. So the world is changing at a faster rate. So this, in a sense, isn't a circle. It's a spiral. It's an, an ending spiral of transformation that's getting faster and faster and faster. And things fly off. They don't stay contained. They don't stay fixed within a system. Things end up in places that were not in any way intended. <coughs> we create products and they arrive in very different ways with very different consequences in the world. So this is a very uneven situation. This is a situation which creates the condition of the unsustainable. And design is deeply implicated in this. We bring things into the world that create a particular kind of future, but they also de-future. Creation is indivisible from destruction. Whenever we make something, whenever we create something, we destroy something. Every time you look at something, you, s you can see creation and destruction. And one of the problems with design, one of the problems of design education, we focus on creation and we ignore destruction. We don't teach people to be able to recognize what they destroy. And because of that, we avoid recognizing 
the ethical design line between creation and destruction. And it isn't a simple good or bad, black or white. It's a question of being able to make a calculated estimation of the degree. The question you have to ask yourself, does what I bring into existence warrant what I'm going to destroy? Does what I'm bringing into existence warrant what I'm going to destroy? It's a very hard question to answer. It's a question that continually begs a lot of thinking. This is one image that represents the complexity that we've created. This is an image of a city. We think we know what cities are. We think that we can see the city. But cities have become unknowable. You either see them from a height as an abstraction, or you see them from the level of the street as the familiar. We can't know the complexity of the cities that now we are creating. The city of Tokyo, 38 million people. How can you know a city of 38 million people? Cities are designing events. The idea, the notion of a designing event is a very important thing to understand. When I was talking about ontological design, when we're talking about things, they are not just things. They are processes. As processes, they exist in time. As they exist in time, they are events. So, that's the situation that we face. And that means that we need to look at things in a different way. You could, in a sense, cross out the word product and replace it with the word process, because every product exists in process. So this is an example of the extremes of humanity that I was talking about. You know, this is one cosmology that creates an identity that isn't based upon the idea of a human being. This is an identity that makes no distinction between the natural and the human. The notion of being in nature. Uh, what we do is we fail to recognize that we are two things. We are a culturally constructed human being and we are an animal, uh, uh, an entity in nature. We, re we refuse our naturalness. These cosmologies, these cosmologies embrace that condition of naturalness. At the other extreme, we are moving towards having a relation to technology that is an imitation of us and that becomes us. So there is a huge amount in between. So the very notion, as I've been saying, of humanity has become just part of the complexity. And the complexity that we have is beyond our understanding of complexity. We try to understand complexity, but it is beyond us. So, this is not simply a picture of robots making a car. This is a picture of technology making the world. This is a picture, in a sense, of a part of us handing over world making to a technology. This is an accelerating process. 
a process that is going to get faster and more dramatic as time goes on. This is not a process that we're in charge of. This is an illustration of what I was saying earlier on about we know how to do these things. We have the technical capability of doing these things, but we lack the ability to understand the consequences. So, as I've said, the underside of what's happening uh, is that there are people who are at the other end of the benefit of our technological achievements. And there's a direct relation to these people and technology. These people are displaced by the technology of war. These people are displaced by the consequence of the climate change that we have added to. So, this is a picture, another kind of picture, of a process of dehumanization. And it could affect any of us. It is not very far away. It could happen here. This is how close it is. Caracas. So, this is an image of a designed environment. This is one form of design. This is the informal design for survival. This is simply find ways that people find ways in a condition of deprivation of trying to make a world in the world with whatever they can find, with whatever means that they've got. This is also a picture of a disaster. This is a picture of a nation on the edge of collapse, a nation that is on the edge of your nation, a nation where there are these people arriving. Over two million refugees have come out of Venezuela in the last year. So dealing with this problem, this is also a picture of a failure of design, a failure of politics, a failure of, failure of economics, a failure of equity. This is a problem that exists here in this city, a problem that exists in this country. It's a problem of design. This is another place. This is the city of Cairo in Egypt. This city has 18 million people. Three million people come into that city every day. So you think that Bogota has a problem with traffic. This city as a ring road. Uh, this city has traffic lights. Nobody takes any notice of the traffic lights at all because there are so many people living in informal <coughs> housing that there's no way for the police to actually deliver infringement notices. So nobody takes any notice of traffic lights. The people who drive make the rules of the road. This is a city on the edge of abandonment. The abandonment of the wealthy, leaving behind the poor. So this city is being abandoned for a variety of reasons. It's abandoned because eventually it's going to be destroyed by 
sea level rises. But long before that happens, it's going to move out into the desert. Egypt builds cities in the desert. Those cities are a long way from the River Nile. They don't have any rain. The River Nile is the only source of the water. The water gets pumped to the cities. I'll say more about that in a moment. This is what is replacing the city of Cairo. This is an image of the new capital of Egypt. And it's an example of the stupidity of design. This city has a park twice the size of Central Park in New York. It has a Disneyland four times the size of Disneyland in California. This is the city that all the government departments, all the wealthy companies are going to move to from Cairo. It is being built now. This isn't a fiction, it is a reality. And this is a Eurocentric model. The model, the, the image, the design, the concept of this city does not come from Egypt. This is a picture of colonialism. This is a picture of destruction. This is a picture of defuturing. This city can only exist by pumping water out of the Nile 120 kilometers. The result of doing that is potentially able to cause a war. Ethiopia are building a dam which will take more water out of the Nile. Ethiopia and Egypt are very likely in a few decades to have a war over water. So this is what we do by design without thinking. And it isn't unique to this place. This is a global phenomenon. There will be mega cities built all over Africa that have started to be built in exactly the same way as this. So, what I'm talking about is the unthinking of design. Now, there's obviously a big leap between the scale of the problems that I've been talking about and what we can do as individuals, what you can design, how you can make design a contribution to the solution in a modest, everyday, everyday practice way. So I want to spend time just kind of giving you a picture of what we have to be able to learn to do. We have to be able to confront the problem of consumption by design. We have to eliminate things that we design that contribute to the problem. So when we design a product, we have to ask the question of whether it is necessary, whether it is actually contributing to the future or damaging the future. We have to actually recognize that we have to learn how to get rid of things by design. Design for elimination has to be a practice that we develop, has to be a practice that we teach, had to be a, a practice as a student that we learn. We have to learn how to change people's perception by design, so the practice of visual communication, of graphic design, of designing interface, 
all the kind of areas of digital design have the potential to recode how we see the world. We need to learn ourselves how to see the world in a different way and how to present that to other people. So we start to value the world in a different way because our perception of it has changed. I'm trying to do a tiny, tiny little example of that this morning with what I'm saying to you. I'm hopefully trying to get you at least to see the world in a slightly different way than when you walked in the door this morning. I'm also suggesting that we need to understand what is critical, what we actually are able to have a critical relation with. So criticality has to be something that we use to bring to design. So more practically, more concretely, I'm giving one word enormous importance, and that word is care. Como se dice care in Espanol? Okay. Okay. Designing things, systems, organizations with care. Careful design. Design full of care. Care as a function. So you bring something to, into existence that works opera, op operationally. What does it take care of? How does it deliver care? Care as a design principle. Care as a way of making. Care as a mode of being in the world. So that we care for the world, we care for each other. So I'm not telling you what to design. I'm telling you what should direct what you design. Care as a design ethic. Care as a social relation. We have to learn to care for each other. We depend upon the natural world, the water, the air, the food that we grow to survive. But we also depend upon each other. We depend on a biological ecology. We depend upon a social ecology. So we have to be able to repair not just the world that is broken, but the communities and the social relations that are broken. That is something that design can make a huge contribution to. We have to care against everything I've said about the destruction of humanity. We have to care for the future. The future is our responsibility. The damage to the future is a result of our neglect. So, that's really what I'm going to leave you with. This is where I live. I live in a privileged place. I'm very aware of my privilege. The privilege of my place uh, is that it's got the cleanest air in the world. It's a place where it's very easy to grow really good food. It's a place where the natural environment is not destroyed. So I have to be able to kind of act on the basis of my privilege. And design is the way that I'm trying to do that. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm very happy to answer any questions.
Bueno, vamos a dar paso a las preguntas. Aquí tenemos pues algunos papeles por si alguien desea eh, anotar la pregunta en español y traducirla o si quieren pues hacerlas directamente. Alzan la mano. Ah, ok, aquí empezamos con las preguntas. Hi Tony, thanks Hi. for coming here. I want to ask you something about you talk about the complex of technology, and, but when you talk about the complex of technology and society, I want to ask you what is the sense of design with care? If uh, I mean, who has the power when we design? Who who says what is the truth or not when we design? I'm talking about ontological design, for yeah. example. Being designed by things is not also being designed by ideology. I mean. We, as designers, we never have has the power, so... Okay, so that's an important question. I'll, I have two things to say about it. One is everything that we design is political. Design is politics. If we're making decisions that impact and change the world, that is political. So design is a political practice, whether you like it or not, whether you actually are informed by it or not, it is political. Then the next question of power goes back to what I said about the necessity to change design. And one of the ways that we need to change the design is for the designer to become more independent. Now, not all designers are going to do that because at the moment, dominantly, design is a service profession. But design has to become um, an autonomous practice, an independent practice, where designers make the most important design decisions. At the moment, clients, corporations, ideologies make the design decisions. And one of the most significant thinkers about autonomous design This Colombian is here, is Arturo Escobar. So if you don't know Arturo Escobar's work, find it. Uh, his book, Design for the Pluriv Designs for the Pluriverse, is an important book, not just for Colombia, but everywhere. So you need to start to create another imagination of what it is to be a designer. And autonomous design is one of the ways that we can begin to do that. It isn't the immediate answer. It is not perfect, but it is a place to begin. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about the relationship between post-human design and AI. How okay. You? Thank you. Okay, so one of the interesting things about AI uh, is some of the people that were the leaders in creating it are some of the people that are now getting very concerned about what they've created. In many ways, AI could be a monster or already is a monster. It has the ability to do extraordinary things. It equally has the ability to destroy us. So it requires a new relation. It comes back to what I've said about criticality. We can't walk away from it. It is here, it is now, it's going to move on into the future. But we need to change how we think about it, how we engage it. We need to have a far more critical relation to it Um, and uh, we need to be able to develop forms of resistance. So the question is, how do we resist technologies that potentially can colonize us? We have a history of forms of colonialism. First it was a physical imposition then it was a mental, intellectual and cultural imposition and now we have the danger of a complete loss of thinking, a loss of consciousness as a result of our own actions in bringing a technology 
that can destroy our consciousness. That is the danger of AI. Thank you. Hi, Tony. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. I especially liked uh, at the end of your talk how you made a very swift um, jump from criticality to care. Yes. And I uh, like that a lot of the times, a lot of times it's presented as almost mutually exclusive. And they say, like, you either act in a critical mode or you act in a caring mode. And I like that you present them in a kind of in the same. Uh, it made me think also of a lecture of Andrea Botero where she said that we had to pass from uh, matters of fact to matters of concern. And then yeah. she said we even have to overcome that to think of matters of care. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. But m my question is more in terms of uh, how can we use ontological design uh, as a tool, an awareness, um, an understanding to help form future designers. I say it because I've been turning around a lot uh, about your notion of ontological design. Yes. Uh, and I can see it in different ways. You know, just, just to understand it is okay, to understand the consequences and implications of design beyond the object and beyond the immediate action of the designer? Yeah. Uh, or is it more also about how can we enact some agency in different moments of, uh, of like the ontological life of a, of a design? Like how do you see the different modes in which ontological design can be used uh, okay. for training probably new designers or for ourselves as well as designers and educators? So the I think it has two, there's two strategies. The first strategy is it needs to become a central feature, not just of design education, but of education in general. Uh, to understand the world, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're an engineer, whether you're a, an accountant, whether you're a banker, whether you're a designer, you need to understand how the world works. And ontological design is a fundamental way of understanding how the design work, how the world works. So we need to make ontological design a part of the way in which a student first arrives in a degree. And we need to, un we really need to privilege an education about the world before we try to teach people how to design. So we spend more time educating designers. So you could have the first year exclusively about educating designers about the world, about ontological design, and their responsibility of bringing things into existence. And then you have to learn how to understand the process of designing in relation to ontological design, which means that you're changing how somebody perceives what they are bringing into existence by design. So when you design something, it's not what it looks like, it's not what it, it is styled to do, it's not its mechanical function, the primary thing is what it does in the world. So, you know, that means you've got a different way of critically interrogating it. So when you designate what it is you're going to design, the first question is what will this thing that I'm creating potentially ontologically design? That acts as a corrective that will then change how you design what it is you're trying to bring in to existence. And then one of the things that becomes incredibly important with all of this is to understand that we make the mistake of privileging solutions. You know, we have the kind of uh, the saying and design of design as a problem solving practice. Design is a problem-defining practice that is engaged ontologically. So what that means 
is that we never move away from learning. Ontological design isn't something that you learn to do, and then you've done it, and then you can just go on doing it. It arrives as something that requires to be learnt anew every time you begin to design something. So it's a transformation of the perception of the mind of the designer. Can I uh, just uh, a reaction? I will thank you for your for your answer. I was thinking also um, when you showed the image of uh, Caracas. Um, yes. It came to my mind also this um, uh, squat that they had Torre David, which was like uh, basically a squat made in the kind of uh, ruins of yes. the of a kind of I think a financial tower or something yes. like that. And I, I also see that as a kind of uh, Ontological design, as a way of how uh, other kind of inhabitants, as you say, that were like uh, more yeah. kind of focused on necessities, were like reappropriating in the ruins of the old. Yeah. Also, like maybe that's also something that designers can have uh, some kind of awareness of. Not so much of thinking like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to do something that is going to become a ruin and then some it's going to be appropriated. Yeah. This would be a bit fake. But thinking of also how we can build maybe also on the ruins of what's uh, kind of crumbling or what is, is being inhabited. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's, there are actually, th we have three options. The first option is bringing something new into existence. And that's what we privilege, but it's wrong. The first option has to be to deal with what we've already created. So uh, I, I work on cities. The, the concept that I'm using is called metrofitting, which is recognizing that we need to repair and transform what already exists in cities. We can't transform cities just by new buildings. We can't transform the cities just by a few sustainable buildings. We have to make the cities themselves transformed through what already exists. So you take the idea of retrofitting up to a city urban scale. Um, so there's kind of the new, and then there's what you've said about living in the ruins. But the ruins that we exist in aren't just physical ruins. We live in a condition of intellectual ruins. There's a famous book written in 1997 called The University in Ruins. The university equally has to be remade. It doesn't look like a ruin. You're in a nice building. But what's happened to the universities is that they've become more focused upon making things instrumentally, less critically. So we need to remake the universities to be more critical. So living in the ruins uh, is something that we're doing. If we're destroying the world, we're making more ruins. Now just one sort of incidental thing. In looking at the picture of a city like Caracas, some of the people that are most able to survive um, in disasters are the people who have, in a sense, the less invested in the permanent. So we can learn from the informal. The informal isn't just a condition of economic despair. You know, the, conf the, the, the informal can be a city it can be a community of cooperation. It can be a, a community of, of improvisation. So it isn't quite as the image appears. Yep. There was a, there was a picture at the back. Yep, yep. yep. Están haciendo una pregunta en español y Pablo nos va a colaborar con la traducción. Por eso es una demora. 
Anthony, thank you very much for your lecture. I have uh, one question. Um, in the, uh, at the late 60s, beginning of the 70s, uh, Victor Papanek uh, start to, uh, to award us of what was coming. And uh, when, you s when you show us the picture of uh, Cairo, and, the, um, and when I make the relation of uh, what uh, Zizek is saying about design as uh, an um, ide ideological uh, estate apparatus, what those countries are trying to, uh, to reach is the new form of living like the first wall can uh, present and show. So there is a difference, uh, uh, how do you say? Um, we have uh, difficulties to uh, hear and to say, okay, you, you have to resist and to change your uh, mentality about the design yeah. when what they expect to, uh, to, um, to arrive is what the, the first world is showing. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, what, what's happening not just here, but in other parts of the world, in Asia and in Africa, is a recognition that the kind of the first world, in inverted commas, Eurocentric model of the future is not viable, is not possible, and is not even desirable. So the, what's happening in the global north is slowly there is a beginning of a recognition of a Eurocentric perspective as being a violence, an imposition, uh, one that has to be transformative of what happens in the global north. In the global south, there is a beginning, a beginning that's happening here, that's happening in this university of people recognition, re recognizing there has to be a way of developing a form of design in the global south for the global south, which is a huge imaginary challenge. But there is a kind of a thinking that's arriving that can help this develop. Uh, and it comes from kind of critical theory and it's around the notion of the borderland, the notion of what has to happen is a selective relation to Eurocentric knowledge and to take what is appropriate from here and reject which is not. At the same time, uh, there has to be a kind of a recognition that indigenous culture isn't just of the past and indigenous culture is a resource in the present for the future that needs to be really critically examined, interrogated, because there are solutions within it that invite innovation, that invite being brought into a dialogue with the critical selection from Eurocentric knowledge. So, in many ways, you know, what I said a moment ago about informal communities in some respects having an ability to survive and having a future, as the situation in the global north gets worse, which it will, the situation in the global south, in a sense, becomes far more significant globally. So in a sense, I think you need to view your situation as positive, that what you lack is an advantage as much as a disadvantage. So it means that there is a kind of a way in which there has to be a shift in perception of what is desired and desirable. Much of what is desired is destruction, as illustrated by that picture of New Cairo. Yeah, tiene una pregunta. No, aquí.
Sí, por aquí sí, por aquí. Um, how can we distinguish if we are creating something, some product, service, process, if it's going to create a future or destroy the future? Okay, that comes back to what I've said about education. That has to be something that people, on the one hand, are taught how to do. That has to be part of the curriculum. There have to be professors who are able to teach that. They have At the same time, it has to be something that you engage uh, as an activity of discovery. There isn't like a book that you can go look up a solution. We're at the beginning of learning something new. Okay. And the only way we're going to learn is to try and to fail and to correct and to learn. It's, so you can't do it unless you do it. You can't do it unless you do it. You have to make it a project. You have to explore it by trying. And it doesn't mean that you either succeed or you fail. As you learn, you incrementally improve. You get better at doing it. You can be, become more informed. So what, what happens is that we are impatient. We want to be able to do things instantly. You know, we want to succeed straight away. But one of the lessons of life is that competence, expertise, is something that takes time. We have, we have urgent problems to address, but we don't have the means to actually instantly resolve them. We have to begin a process, and that process is intergenerational. It's going to take many generations. And, you know, we had a conversation yesterday, and I'll just share one of the observations from that conversation yesterday, which is that the kind of things I've been talking about, and what you know of the world in which we exist, is that the problems can seem impossible. They can seem insurmountable. But it's only because of the limit of what we know that our understanding of what's impossible uh, isn't an empirical fact. It's about our knowledge. So if we become no more knowledgeable, we also increase the condition of possibility. If you were to step back 100, 200, 300 years, and you were to look at the future, almost everything that you would see would have thought to have been impossible. We're always, in, always achieving the impossible. The history of our being is of a being who achieves the impossible. So that's being realistic. Uh, it's a question of not being disabled by the problem, of being enthused and energized by responding to the situation. Um, hello, Tony. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much for your conference. Um, sometimes it happens to me in a particular and selfish way that I keep on going with my normal life and thinking that these catastrophes that you have mentioned before yeah. um, won't be able to touch me. How do we start to change the way we think about that selfish feeling in our daily basis, and how do we start to aware others? Okay, so we all suffer from a condition which the Greeks called aphasia, aphasia. And aphasia is knowing what is the right thing to do, but not doing it, okay? That's what you're describing. So, what we have to do is to actually employ ontological design for ourselves. We have to be able to use design for ourselves. 
Design isn't something that we simply do for others. Design as something that we have to do for ourselves. So you have to turn, in a sense, yourself into a design project. You have to be able to create the circumstances that confront what you've just been saying. And we have little tiny openings into that. So um, you look at the wardrobe, all your clothes. Um, and uh, you actually make those clothes that you don't wear present. So instead of buying something new, you take something old. Uh, you look at the food that you eat and how you cook it. Uh, you look at the nature of your home. You turn your home and your life into a design project. So, you know, in a sense, if you come to a, a university, if, if you're learning something, there is a curriculum, there's a program of learning. So you create a program of learning for yourself. You take care of yourself. In taking care of yourself, you're taking care of the world in which you exist. Uh, all you need to do is to find a place to start. Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, th there is a, 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 an idea that, I, that we usually have to mm, deal with uh, whenever we talk to somebody who believes absolutely in capitalism and yeah. in the way that capitalism is led by technology. Yeah. So in this, in th this idea uh, consists on um, they think and, and they have this hope that uh, the technology that is mm, to be developed will for sure find the answer for all the catastrophes that you yeah, already yeah, yeah, yeah. showed us. That's something that uh, it's really complicated, or, or it has been complicated for us to, yeah. to deal with. Yeah. How have you dealt with that kind of uh, okay. argument? So what, what happens is that people postpone acting. They don't do anything because they think technology is just going to arrive and solve the problem. And that, that, that is based upon a fundamental failure to understand the nature of technology. Uh, and, and at the heart of that is the, the assumption that there is technology and there is us. But as I try to explain, that isn't the reality. The reality is that we are technological beings. Now what has happened with technology as it is, it's tr b developed beyond being simply a thing, simply being a tool, to becoming something which is metaphysical, something which is knowledge. So the way in which technology is developed, in a sense, it's been dematerialized. It has a materiality, but has a immaterial existence as knowledge. So capitalists would call this the knowledge economy. Okay. Um, so if you say that there has to be a, a solution and the solution is going to arrive by technology, and then if you recognize that we are technology, that simply comes back to us. We have to be the solution. We don't simply use technology. Technology equally uses us. So this comes back to this notion of criticality. We need to be able to develop a critical relation to technology, recognizing that we are part of it. So we have to be able to make it strange. We have to create a certain condition of alienation. And that only comes through knowledge. That doesn't stop us being technological beings, but it means that we are become aware of ourselves as technological beings. These aren't, you know, these, these aren't questions that are able to be answered 
in this kind of very brief way that I'm doing. These are kind of intellectual, intellectual expeditions which we only have partial answers. And what's happened is that in terms of the philosophy of technology, is technology has developed at a faster rate than our ability to make sense of it. So we're trying to catch up. Um, do you think that it is possible to open in uh, an environment as Colombian one um, way to ontological designers? I mean, instrumental universities educate instrumental designers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from uh, 20 years now, mm -hmm. I'm bored to see designers uh, uh, competing each other uh, about who is better uh, in the mm, use of a software, yeah, who, yeah. who do the, the, the best uh, yeah. furniture, yeah. no more. Yeah. Um, I, I am uh, worried about the labor uh, market uh, constrictions. Yeah. Uh, what is your uh, suggestion to ontological designers in front of uh, market realities? Okay. So, first of all, I wouldn't be in this room now unless there was the possibility of change in this institution. Why would you invite me if you wanted to maintain things as the same? Um, so there is a, certainly a possibility. Uh, and in terms of the market relation, I have no illusion that it's going to go away. I have no illusion that there aren't going to be many designers who are going on simply seeing design in the way that dominantly exists. But I'm also absolutely confident that we can create a culture, a counterculture of design, using ontological design, using design for the global south to make a really big impact that starts to create other possibilities. But I can't start, and neither can you, we can't start at the end. We can't, we can't utopianly construct a vision of us creating a form of design that immediately transforms everything. What we have to do is act in good faith on the basis of recognizing that there is a necessity for change and that we begin a process of change. That's all we can do. We can't, do, we can't act in a condition of certainty. We live in an uncertain world. Certainty is an illusion. So we have to act in good faith, with courage, uh, with a sense that there is no choice but to act if we want a future as a future. So we can't act on the basis, I'm only going to act if I'm going to succeed. We don't know whether we're going to succeed. But that's no reason, not for acting. Thank you, Professor Tony. Um, I wanted to ask you, I've been thinking about the relationship among design and politics. Yeah. And I've also been thinking that the state is supposed to take care of people. Yeah. And in this relation, it, they design, in a way, politics. But how exactly can design give something in this state? How can we uh, take part in making maybe life for others better? Or, and politics has everything to do not only with policy, but with economy. Mm -hmm. So designers should be there and should be thinking how is our society for the future. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this like in a small circle, but I would like you to give me like other north. Okay, so. Just to, just to say a few words about politics. Politics is part of the problem. Politics is part of the crisis. So uh, 
we don't actually have a viable politics. Democracy around the world is failing. Democracy is part of the crisis. Democracy cannot engage the scale of the problems that we face. So the agenda of politicians is not the agenda of the future. Politicians are recognizing in an unstated way that the system of politics that they're in can't actually uh, really address the future because their understanding is about maintaining things as they are, maintaining the status quo, keeping the economy going as it is now functioning, maintaining the regime of power that now exists. Whereas to address the problems uh, is incredibly challenging. So you can't get sustainability democratically by people voting. People are not going to vote for the kind of things, the kind of changes that sustainability demands. So it, that actually makes design even more important politically. So what I'm really saying in relation to design is if you embrace it politically, that means that you try to make the things that you bring into existence by design as political agents. I'll, I'll illustrate that with a, a project that is actually happening here in this institution. I don't know very much about it, but there is a student project at the moment that is dealing with prisons. You know, the prison situation in Colombia needs to be dramatically reformed. It needs to be much, much better than it is. Sending to people to prison is politically something that wins votes. Politics, you know, uh, in a sense, doesn't deal with that problem. It ignores the, the nature of prisons because prisons are not something which win votes unless you're sending people to prison. So design as politics, actually being able to identify a different kind of process, in all, in being able to create another kind of discussion about prisons, being able to kind of expose just how bad the prison system is by design. All of those things have the potential to actually generate action which changes the political situation, coming out of another vision arriving, another critique arriving, another visual presentation of the problem arriving. So we have options that are available to us, but that means, and links to this notion of autonomous design, that means the designer has to act independently. So it's very difficult to be a service provider to a corporation and to be political uh, because all the major design decisions are made by the corporation in order to be able to make design an active, transformative politics. It requires the designer to be independent. But that doesn't mean to say that the designer can't earn a living. It means that you earn a living in a different way, by being propositional. You know, if you can identify a problem that needs to be solved, and there's somebody in the community, in the economy, who wants that problem solved, then you have the ability of earning a living. you author asked me to deliver some speech in Spanish to my fellow yeah, yes, woman. Yes, no uh, problem. Bueno, una cosa para mí es bien importante, esta sesión le comentaba a los que estaban al lado por la cantidad de preguntas, por la cantidad de personas, digamos que este proyecto de los diseños del sur y de los diseños autónomos y de esas formas que se salen 
de lo que llamaríamos el mundo de la mayoría se han vuelto una cosa bien importante, digamos que hay ya un grupo, un público amplio aquí y en varias partes, quería hacer una pequeña cuña. I'm going to, to talk about the, the journal. Yeah, yeah. Eh, porque eh, finalizamos esta semana, apareció un número de una revista brasileña, del Strategic Design Research Journal, SDRJ. El último número trata eh, sobre ideas que hemos conversado con Tony y con Arturo Escobar eh, entre otros desde hace varios años, es un número especial que tiene que ver con los procesos de diseño autónomo eh, y cómo utilizar estrategias de diseño que habiliten estos procesos de diseño de los que hemos conversado. En la eh, revista, eh, que como digo, pues compartiremos pues, en las redes, en la página de la escuela y en varias partes, eh, sobre una idea que trajo Fernando del Ecuador, eh, utilizamos el, el, el polílogo que digamos, una conversación entre muchas realidades, hizo, se hizo un número compartido donde hay una pieza de, de, de Tony, otra de Ezio Mancini, otra de Arturo Escobar, otra de Rosan Show, otra de Anne Light, dentro de los invitados, y hay eh, siete papers que pasaron por un review de papers, eh, uno de Pablo Calderón y su, y su equipo, y la editamos en conjunto eh, como editores invitados por la Universidad de Unicinos en Brasil, eh, Andrea Botero, quien está en eh, la Universidad de Ulu en Finlandia, Kiara del Gaudio, que está en Unicinos eh, en Brasil, y yo, pero una segunda fase, digamos que la, el requisito de la revista era el lenguaje en inglés, pero estamos convencidos de la necesidad de ampliar esto y de que se escuche la voz eh, original, porque en muchas partes la voz ha sido en español, entonces probablemente vengan productos al respecto. Quería hacer eso y invitarlos a leer sobre el particular. Uh, how um, have been your uh, experience re -signific signifying uh, the notion and the making of design on, uh, on the circuit or environment of uh, no designers, uh, spe uh, specifically con no entiendo la segunda parte de la letra. Dice, después. Ah, ah. Ah. Your experience with autonomous movement or uh, usually non-designers people, non-professional people mm -hmm. of resistance, yeah? Yeah, okay. Mm. People usually, uh, uh, professional club member people think that they are not designers. Yeah, okay. So, um, I could give you an, an, an example. Um, I'll give you an example from Egypt, where I've worked. So, at the top of Egypt is the Nile River Delta, which is where most of the food in Egypt is grown. But because of sea level rises, 30% of that has got salt in the soil. So it's becoming very hard to grow food. So those people are leaving that area. Uh, and that the agricultural design challenge is one problem. The other problem is where are these people going to go? And because already three million people are coming to Cairo every day because Cairo is a very difficult city to live in with lots of problems. You don't want those people from that region to go to Cairo. So a mayor of a village uh, talked to a friend of mine and we went to see the mayor of that village. So there are 15 villages in this area below the car, the delta. So the project uh, is to connect 15 villages to make a city. But all the decisions, all the discussion, you know, c comes out of the people living in those villages. So that discussion is a whole series of design decisions being made by those people in that village. So the designer the people that I'm working with, they're being designed 
by the design decisions of the people living in that area. So that's one example. The other example is what, what's happening uh, is that many people outside of design with expertise, uh, and that can be from various areas, it can be from psychology, it can be from geography, it can be philosophy, it can be from anthropology, are becoming interested in design. Some of the most interesting writing on, in design is not being made by designers. You know, we've mentioned Arturo Escobar several times. Arturo is an anthropologist. He's not a designer. He's had conversations with designers. He's had conversations with me. And we've informed each other. We've learned from each other. So that is what is beginning to happen. So I invite you, everybody in this room, you're in a university with lots of expertise, you know, you need to be talking to other people if you're not already in the university. They need to discover more about design and you need to benefit from the, no the knowledge that they have. So I started off by saying design needs to become more important and to be more important it needs to be more open and needs to be talking to more people. And it needs to recognize that the people that you work with, you have to design with. You don't design for people, you design with people. <laughs> Louder without the door. No? Yeah. yeah, maybe also connected to what uh, Carolina was uh, was asking, and uh, in relation to what you're saying of uh, of Arturo Escobar, uh, because I found interesting what you mentioned also about design uh, needing to be more autonomous, yeah, yeah, or independent, yeah, uh, and uh, I, I see it in a slightly different way. Not necessarily that uh, we have to have more agency to work within a realm, or I don't know if I misunderstood it. Mm -hmm but more in terms of that we have to uh, articulate our interest with other type of communities, like understand that, yeah. uh, so Arturo Escobar speaks about the ontological capacity of, uh, of being in the world with a community that you can respond to uh, their interest and design with yeah. them, as you were saying. So even uh, what Carolina was asking, I also think was, uh, co uh, last question, I think was connected also to not only work within the university, but also with, from outside the university, with yeah, yeah, yeah. social movements, with uh, uh, different uh, organizations oh. and, and yeah. groups. Um, so my, my question and my comment is mostly related to that autonomy. Uh, how can we expand also that, that notion of, of uh, autonomy to understand that we can also work and articulate with uh, social movements, with uh, different kind of um, uh, bottom-up uh, organizations yeah, yeah, yeah. or grassroots organizations. Yeah, yeah like yeah. design as activism as well, but yeah. not necessarily. Well, I mean, the, the, only, the only way to do that is to approach people, to talk to people, to get involved in projects. So you get involved in a project and then you reveal yourself as a designer, you don't come to a project and say, I'm a designer, I'm going to change your project. You know, you, you actually do things that um, uh, allow people to see that design can make a contribution, that design can be part of the, the conversation. But the other thing I would say is that even if you don't do that, even if you're not working autonomously, even if you're working with a corporation, you can still engage in active change. And one of the ways you can do that is through a, a, a method called a return brief. When somebody asks you to do something and you say to them, I've understood what you've asked me to do, but I would like to provide you with alternatives, with other ideas. So you have a client and you don't simply do what the client tells you to do, 
that you're trying to create a, a dialogue with the client. So it isn't quite as simple as having one choice or the other. Uh, and in terms of a career, you know, you have to be able to get expertise and competence to be able to become an autonomous designer. You can't just walk out the door when you graduated. Uh, it takes again and another learning. It's a self-education. So all of these things arrive by degree. Talking about this, this, this kind of interactions between we as designers, as yep. kind of professional field uh, with uh, communities and stuff, one of the um, tools that has been most uh, used for these designers who go there is design thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, I have some, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, what can design thinking according to Tim Brown uh, ideology and yeah, what yeah. he thinks can do in this in this environment uh, what would you think about this uh, the use of this tool uh, in this in this uh, okay. spaces so i mean i'm familiar with design thinking i know where it comes from i know the corporations that adopt it and it's about extending the ability of design to create more commodities so it, it's creating knowledge commodities uh, so, I would simply say, you know, is design thinking actually thinking? Uh, and that, that uh, kind of begs the question of what is thinking? And the philosopher Martin Heidegger simply points out that thinking fundamentally is philosophy. Uh, and thinking is philosophy. So one of the things that has happened because of the instrumentalization of education and the world is that thinking has been devalued. Philosophy has been devalued. So people think that philosophy is kind of esoteric and marginal, something that actually hasn't anything to do with the nature of the world in which we exist. But if we are to change, then we need to be able to think in a new way. And the only way that can we do that is to engage and participate and develop a philosophy. So design thinking is not philosophy uh, uh, in the real sense of philosophy. Uh, which is why, you know, one of the things that I write on, one of the things I work on is design philosophy. And uh, there's my um, my website is up there. there. There's a journal that we ran for, uh, for, for 12 years called Design Philosophy Papers. There, there, are, uh, there are a huge number of papers up there that you can take for nothing. They don't cost anything. Uh, and we're just on the edge of de developing a book project which takes over from the journal, which is Design Philosophy Books. What I've been talking about today when I'm talking about ontological design, is design philosophy. Ontological design is a philosophy of design. And I hope I've shown you that it is both critical in terms of thinking and practical in terms of value. Más preguntas? Todos? Eso es todo, parece, sí. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Tony. Muchísimas gracias a todos por su asistencia. Muchas gracias.